Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to part two of July 30th at the Poison Pen. We began with Karen Dion, a Putnam author, and we are lucky that number one best-selling author, John Sanford, also from Putnam, is joining us this evening to talk to Nicholas Griffin. I don't think I really need to introduce John to you because you will be familiar with him, but you may not know that when he's not writing thrillers, or before he was writing his best-selling thrillers, in his real name is John Camp. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who worked at the Miami Herald, which has relevance to what we're going to do. So Nicholas Griffin, I love, I absolutely love your little bio on your website, and it's so cute I'm going to read it because it's really great. I was born in London, says Nick. I left when I was 18. I spent the next 20 years in New York and moved to Miami in the summer of 2013. I've written for newspapers, magazines, film, and TV, but books, well, I like books the best. I've got an English father, an American mother, a Venezuelan wife, a surfing son, a skateboarding daughter, and a very old dog from New Jersey. <laughs> I met Nick in the year 2000 over a wonderful book that he wrote called The House of Sight and Shadow. It was a mix of medical lore, myth, and history set in the early 18th century in London featured an eminent anatomist and his ambitious students. So those of you who hang out at the Poison Pen know this is like meat and drink to me to read those kinds of books. I love them. We've lost touch, but now here we are, connected again, Nick. It's wonderful. And so we are connecting you with Mr. Sanford. And Patrick is going to step into my seat because much of what you're going to talk about is an area that Patrick really loves to spend time in as well, which is true crime and cartels and border issues and Journalism. Do you want to ask John about his arm first? Oh, right. So, John, um, you're joining us as a wounded warrior. What happened to you? I know we can't actually see your arm, but you've had a you've had an accident. Well, I was uh, I sold a cabin in the north woods of Wisconsin, and I uh, wanted to keep a canoe, which is the canoe that I took down the Mississippi River 40 years ago now, top to bottom by myself. So it had some emotional resonance with me. I put it up on top of my pickup truck, a Ford F-150, and I started down the highway, and I got to Iowa, out where there is very little bit farms, and the canoe started to come off. So I got out of the car, pulled off I-35, got out of the car, uh, grabbed hold of the, the gutter at the top of the door, and started pushing on the canoe with my other hand, and my hand came loose from the gutter, and I fell backwards into a ditch. And when I got up, my arm didn't work. And uh, I was, a couple of really nice Iowans helped me put the canoe back up on the roof and tie it down. And then I had to drive like 37 miles to the nearest hospital, which hurt a lot. And uh, when I got there, they said, I thought I dislocated my shoulder, but they said, no, you've broken it. I broke it just below the shoulder, right here. You can probably see that. Yeah. And it's gonna be a couple of months in this, uh, in this sling. Well, what a fortunate thing that you probably can take a little break from, well, let's see, we don't have a virtual this fall, so part of the reason you're here is because I miss you, because normally our fall involves you and Virgil, um, and we'll have Lucas and Virgil in what, April again? Uh, we'll have, we'll have Davenport in April, but uh, and you'll probably be the first to hear it, I am writing a Letty book. Oh, uh, finally, after all these years I've named you about Letty? Simultaneously with the, with the Davenport book, I don't know if I'll ever publish it because uh, I don't know if I'll ever finish it, but it's got a good start. I'm about 25,000 words in it. So. I am so excited. Well, if the pandemic has brought any blessing, it will be the thought that you are actually writing Letty. So now, yeah. Nick, it's going to be your show, and I will move aside as I promised, and Patrick will take over. All right. Hey gentlemen, how are you? Okay, okay, how's the guitar playing? It's it's going it's going great. How about well, yours is on hiatus for the moment. I was going to ask you about <laughs> that. You, yes, very much on hiatus. Have you taken uh, as as the pandemic helped with the guitar practice? You know, actually it has. And uh, I I bought my wife about a year and a half ago a Fender Mustang short scale bass. Forgive us for a second, Nick. We're just nerding out. And uh, don't worry. And I've got mine about three feet to the right. And she, okay. you know, in a year and a half is really doing great learning how to read music and picking it up really nicely so we might you probably wind up in the stones probably <laughs> yeah so 
Do you know that Nils Lofgren actually is a, is a customer and works here? Say we have a head start. I mean, yeah. not works here, but buy, he bought three books today, yes, actually. Did. Yep. Uh, did, you, did you two have any overlap at the Herald? When were you there, John? I left in November of 1978. Did Nick work at the Herald? No, I didn't, but I was also seven years old in 1978, so I would have been a very young journalist. Well, okay. I, guess, I guess that Ego. overlap was Marry the wrong Ego. question. <laughs> now, I'm just thinking about the, the particular era that Nick's writing about in this book, if there was any overlap between... John. Yes, there was. Yeah. Uh, Nick, Nick let, me, uh, let me talk to Nick for a minute here. Uh, I, I was interested in the fact that I mean, I assume that because you live in Miami is the reason you picked up on this whole 1980 story. And uh, because if you live in Miami, you almost can't avoid hearing about all the different things that happened, the Muriel Bowl lift, the riots, uh, and of course the cocaine culture, which was really getting going about then, uh, or a little bit after that. Um, uh, how did you decide uh, to organize this book around characters like Edna and uh, Marshall Frank and and, uh, and Maurice Ferre. Sure, well, it's, you know, it's, it was one of those subject matters which seemed very manageable when I started. Like 1980, why don't we just keep one city one year? But the, the more I dug in, uh, the bigger I realized this subject was. And when I first handed it over to my agent at 450 pages, uh, my, 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 my editor was rather horrified and was like, look, if this was a movie, you'd have 105 speaking parts. Let's chop everyone out of here and let's cut down to who can really drive the story. You know, who, who has this extraordinary year? And, you know, we, we narrowed it down to Edna Buchanan so that we could look at the Miami Herald. She was a number one crime reporter at the time. We looked at Marshall Frank, who was the captain of Homicide. We looked at the mayor who was trying to keep a, a lid on this boiling city in 1980. And then we looked at the number one Colombian money, money launderer at the time as well. So we could really try and see the city from several different points of view at the same, at the same time. Did, 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 you, uh, uh, did you eliminate from the original draft of your book uh, some kinds of cultural coverage or, or uh, you know, kind of general, general discussion of, of, of how the city felt or how it looked or what it, what it felt like? Or? Yeah, I mean, in some ways I had to because I I think as my editors told me I've got a bit, you know I think I, you know I, I I didn't want to leave anything out so I had everything in there from how you know what was the, the municipal government of Miami like you know when your editor looks you in the eye and goes a national audience may not may not care as much about that as you do uh, back away here's here's the real thread of the book so yeah I, le I left a lot on the table and one of the fascinating things about Miami in 1980 is where you worked at the Miami Herald which was that basically you've got a city where you could live in a different neighborhood and those neighborhoods would be covered by entirely different newspapers. And by neighborhoods, I'm almost talking about races here. So, you know, Miami is sort of split between Latin, white, and black just before 1980. And each one of those races is, uh, you know, basically has their own newspaper, their own radio stations, and live in sort of, in a sort of siloed, balkanized Miami where they don't necessarily have a great understanding of what's happening maybe just a few blocks to the east or the west. Well, that, that was absolutely true in my experience when I lived there. I owned a house in, on the north side of town. One of the things that exasperated all the, the, the trouble that was going on at the same time is that there was this process going on there called neighborhood flipping. And my neighborhood was one that was being flipped in which the real estate dealers would get together and they would decide a neighborhood was going to become black. And uh, after that, they would tell all the clients who might buy there that the neighborhood was going black. It would drive down prices, and it would also drive the white residents in the neighborhood en masse to go to those real estate agents to sell their houses. So it was a way for the real estate agents. But what that caused, it caused a great deal of really ugly feeling between blacks and whites at the time. Um, and, and it was one of those kind of underlying things that was all over sort of the rim or the edges of the black areas there. Uh, I went back, I left in late 1978 in November, and when I went back in 1992 after Hurricane Andrew, uh, the entire area that I lived in, which had been white, was now black, entirely black, with, with all, without exception. And that, 
was just sort of a reflection of the of the some of the racial dynamics that went on in Miami all through the 70s and 80s. And uh, I wanted to say, by the way, uh, did you how, how much did you talk to Edna? Uh, I talked to Edna quite a lot, quite yeah. a lot. I mean, she's a she's an extraordinary extraordinary character. Uh, but I know you, you you used to work uh, at the neighboring desk from her, right? Is, is she still working? She's she's not. Well, I think she's still working on her novels and and okay. other things, but obviously not not the newsroom anymore. I used to sit right in front of her, and I would turn around and put my feet on her desk, and she would sneak up behind me because she hated that, and she would knock my feet off her desk uh, because I was dragging papers and other junk that she had on her desk, and uh, she was an extraordinary. Uh, she was an extraordinary investigator. She and I uh, did a long investigation in 1977 or 76 about one of the early cocaine lords named Ricky Crevero, who is still, I think, in Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Uh, and uh, not because of what we did, we did his story, but, but uh, uh, the cocaine thing seemed to me in your book to be a little separate than the other two things because because the the arrival of the of the Mario Boatlift people put a lot of stress on the city. At the same time, the city was going under a lot of stress because of Janet Reno's prosecution of the of the cops who uh, who who killed Mar uh, McDuffie. Um, but the cocaine thing seemed almost like people were willing to accept the fact that cocaine was bringing a lot of money into town and doing a lot of good. What, what was your attitude toward that? Well, I, the way I look at it is that, you know, we, we know what the three crises are. It's, it's an extraordinary surge of immigration. It's this, this race riot that happens in the middle of the year. And it's drugs, but it's not so much drugs as drug money. And I think what's key to realize at the beginning of 1980 is what the drug money is doing to the city. And what it does is it's rotting out the very institutions that you're absolutely going to need during this triple crisis that comes. So people don't really understand the extent to what that's happening. So A, it's the banks. You know, as soon as the feds start lifting the lids on Miami's banks in 1980, they find 26 banks immediately who are all openly taking drug money and really don't care. There are no anti-money laundering laws that exist in the United States at that point. The second institution that gets totally corrupted is the county homicide department. Because, of course, naturally, there's a coincidence there between where, where homicide and cocaine hit one another. And basically, the homicide department has been seized by a pretty low-level drug dealer uh, who sort of uses them as sort of his own soldiers. And if, you know, he wants a, a rival knocked out of the game, he makes a couple of calls. And then there were several murders that were later attributed uh, to, to, that were probably committed by, by homicide cops. So what then happens is there's an FBI investigation and basically they dismantle most of the homicide department during the greatest ever surge of homicide in American history. So poor Marshal Frank, the captain of homicide, has exactly three detectives who have more than one year's experience who are now supposed to deal with this extraordinary deluge with you know, race, race riots, the Cuban prison system, Colombian hitmen, you name it. It's happening on the streets of Miami in 1980. Yes, it was. <laughs> it makes me laugh, kind of, to think about it because it, because it was such a great city to be a reporter in. I mean, at the same time, it was at the same time it was uh, all this goofy stuff was going on. If you to, to be a reporter at that time in that city uh, was wonderful. Um, and uh, I, I think I talked to Marshall Frank probably three or four times, but I didn't talk to him as a homicide investigator. I don't think. Um, I worked with Edna on a on a on a uh, series of of murders, a serial killer um, who dumped his body out in, uh, bodies out in uh, South Dade County, and I think that's when I talked to Frank a couple of times about those murders. But I, but I I was aware of him, I knew him, and and Edna of course was a good friend. She and I won Pulitzers the same year, and and uh, so we had we had a really kind of an interesting relationship. Um, one of the things I was wondering, did you consider writing about the relationship of the Miami Herald to the black community? <laughs> well, that's, uh, yeah, that's the Miami Herald basically, as you well know, managed to antagonize everyone without really doing that much to antagonize them. But, but basically, the black community has a huge issue with, with, with the Herald and, 
the Herald's coverage or lack of coverage of the black community. And then, of course, Cuban Americans decide they hate the Herald as well. So, so, and of course, the Herald's in this position where it needs its circulation up, and yet the demographics of Miami are changing almost overnight. So, if you look at Miami in '79 and then the beginning of '81, it's almost like you're in two different cities because you've had 125,000 people dropped on top of the city, which, according to Miami city limits, is only 320,000 people. It's like another. It's like having another city dropped on top of you. Not enough housing, not enough schools, not enough space, not enough jobs. Uh, so, you know, you've got a city in total flux. So I think there was always going to be outrage and pressure, but, but you know, there are a lot of people in the black community have, have trouble with that year, and Harold's one of them, and Janet Reno's another who was state attorney that year. Uh, it's just a deeply unhappy city from, from every angle come, come 1980. You, maybe, maybe 78, things are a little chirpier, but, but by well, 80. It, in, in all of those symptoms were there in 78. Uh, with the exception of the Mariel thing, which strikes me as just like putting the lid on the pressure cooker, and and uh, and it was going to blow. Now, when I was there, uh, I did a um, uh, story sent in the Black Ghetto. Um, it, the, the the ghettos in in uh, Miami at the time had nicknames that were taken from Vietnam from the Vietnam War. They're called like the D zone uh, one. The Iron Triangle was another one uh, where the cops, that's what the cops called. And the cops going through, they were like soldiers. They were in cars with big guns. Uh, so it was, it, was, uh, it, it was an interesting situation. Uh, in 1978, during the latter part of Jimmy Carter's uh, administration, the, the unemployment got terrible. And they sent myself and uh, two young black women out into uh, Liberty City and uh, Overtown to do a story about the unemployment there, uh, which was horrific. Uh, the Miami Herald really didn't want the story, uh, but they felt that they were obligated to. Uh, I did another story one time. They had a crime in Miami called contempt of cop. And contempt of cop was when uh, usually a black guy was causing was disturbing the cop's sense of tranquility. And so they'd pick him up on a, on a Friday afternoon and they, and they would charge him with loitering, which was still on the Miami books, but was unconstitutional. Uh, so then he had a choice of either bailing himself out and paying a bail bondsman to do it or staying in the Miami jail for the weekend until the judge threw it out on Monday. So he'd have like three days in jail or, or this bail bondsman fine. Uh, and, the, and the Herald wouldn't run that. They wouldn't go with that story. Uh, I had another situation in which there was a shootout in a black neighborhood down south in the city of Prime, and six people were killed, and the Herald was frantic to get on top of it until they found out that all the people shot were black, and then it wound up on, like, page 16. So my feeling through that period, with exceptions of, of, of numerous reporters, there, there were numerous reporters who saw all of this coming, and Edna was one of them. Edna knew what things were like out in the ghetto, and she did not, um, when somebody was shot, she didn't care whether they were black, white, right. Hispanic, or whatever. She went out and covered them. Uh, but I've always been, you know, I was in no position to make an assessment of what the Herald did myself. Um, did you get any kind of a vibration from Edna or any of the other uh, reporters that, that, that they felt this coming? Yeah, I think I think to some extent, certainly, you know, the only black reporter on the city desk that year was Joe Oglesby. Right. Uh, and I think I think all, you know, if you look at Joe Oglesby or you look at some, some of the, the black leaders in town, every one of them smelt trouble coming in 1980. Uh, in, and some of them literally spelled out what was going to happen that spring. Where, where, you know, they were going to move this explosive trial, they were going to take it up to Tampa, where no white cop had ever been convicted of, of in the death of a, of, a, of a black suspect, and that, you know, they were all going to get off, and that Miami was going to explode no matter what anyone did. And, and pe people spelled it, spelled it out there, and sure enough, that's what happens. But yeah, I think it's, and, it, and it's actually a headline in the black newspaper of the time, you know, that this is going to be the longest, hottest, most violent summer Miami's ever seen. But of course, the Herald, the Herald's not, not, not covering it in, in the same way, nor is the Herald covering the trial in the same way. 
Is Joe Oglesby still around? Yep, yep, he's still yeah. around. Well, say hello to him if you see him again. I, I knew Joe reasonably well, and uh, he's a good reporter. He was a good reporter. I think he might have become a columnist eventually, but I'm not sure. Um, the the uh, You mentioned in passing in your book about the complications of all the different tribes. Um, when I was there, the interesting things were that was it Italians, Jews, Poles, whatever, were called Anglos, <laughs> except by the Jews, the Poles, and Italians who called only people like you Anglos. And then, and then Haitians weren't black because they, they rejected the black label because they didn't want to be identified with Americans. Black, so they, they were Haitians. If you were black and you were Cuban, you weren't black, you were Cuban. And, and if you were if you were Hispanic, it was that was sort of a term that wasn't used very much because the Mexicans who worked uh, the migrant fields down in South Day didn't get along with the Cubans uh, because the Cubans all had had sort of a, a whole different uh, economic idea of, of themselves than the Mexicans did. So, so talk a little bit about that about the tribes. Well, I think what's so fascinating about that is that is that you you know very well how, compli how complex your own tribe is, just as you were describing. For instance, you know, there are a lot of Jamaican immigrants in, in Miami. They didn't necessarily get on very well with African Americans. And the Bahamians were very distinct from both of those groups. And then the Haitians were arriving in big numbers in 1980, and they're at the bottom of the economic pile. But if you're white, you just are looking over there and everyone looks black to you. And you know, vice versa. The blacks look over to the whites, and you know they don't realize that that guy over there is actually Jewish, and he's not even allowed in that country club, country club over there. And that guy's a time thing this afternoon. That, yeah. that that you're that if you're Jewish, you're white until you try to go to the country club up in Palm Beach when you get a problem. Yeah. Um, what what, uh, uh, where, what were your main main sources for for your for all your material? Where's uh, your? Yeah, I mean, I, I did. A, I sat, you know, unfortunately, the Herald digitizes everything after 1982. So I sat there like I was a high school student in 1955 and looked at microfiche for a year, reading my way through oh, the no. Herald, the Miami News, you name it. I read every every newspaper in South Florida for a year. Then, of course, the good news for me was an awful lot of the characters who were, you know, deeply involved in the city then were only in their 30s then, and now they're in their mid-70s to 80s. So I tracked down about 70, 75, 75 folks from, from you know, all, all these different tribes we're talking about. Uh, and yeah, between that and a whole lot of reading and, and running around the states, find, tracking down retirement communities full of ex-detectives, that, that was the job I set myself. How, how did you wiggle out all the information about the, uh, about the cocaine, the, the guy who uh, you know, took the money around to the cocaine banks? Uh, Isaac Catan, yeah, he's a fast, fascinating character because he's really rather a gentleman uh, for the cocaine industry, and he was the first huge money launderer who's laundering three hundred million dollars a year, and he's taking six to eight percent himself. Uh, so he's he's one of the richest men in Florida within a couple of years. Uh, he, I found, yeah, I, I was up in Atlanta digging through all, digging through all the records in the National Archives, and they still have a lot of his his trial stuff. I found his lawyer, uh, and then I tracked down several members of his family in, in Cali. Uh, so, so yeah, a good, a good lot of, good lot of digging. This book did not come quickly. This took me several years, almost five years to, to put together, but, uh, did you have, do you travel to Colombia? Yeah. I've been down to Colombia a few times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Oh, it's a really interesting piece of reporting. Um, so then, uh, these things, this book that you're talking about is almost like a preview of the, of the George Floyd and Rodney King uh, riots that took place after the Miami riot. Uh, I mean, it's almost like it's almost like you could switch the characters around and they'd all fit into each other's stories. I mean, you have a guy who is kind of a, a minor criminal at best, uh, you know, and he does something the cops don't like, and so they they, they beat him. And you know, a couple of them died. One of them didn't, I guess. Um, did, did were you aware of that 
parallel thing? Well, you could have been aware of the, the, the Floyd thing, because that just happened to be. Yeah. When you read this book, it's like reading something that's going on right now. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, obviously I didn't know George Floyd was waiting five years in advance, nor would we be in this incredible uh, turmoil in 2020 in an election year, which really seems so reminiscent of 1980 and what was happening to McDuffie. But I think, you know, the, the McDuffie crime in a way was even more outrageous because A, it happens at 2 a.m. and there are no, there are no witnesses at all. Uh, and, and B, the cops actually, the very first thing they do after they beat McDuffie into a coma was try and cover it up and pretend that it's a traffic accident. So, you know, they know very well that what, they do, what they've just done to McDuffie is, is on the far end of extreme. And in fact, in the central district, then they, they, you know, this came out during the trial, they used to basically have a scorecard for how badly they would beat black suspects. And they, it was one to 30. And McDuffie was considered, I think, a 29 and a half that night. And then they upgraded after he dies from his coma three, three four days later. And no. McDuffie, for, you know, it's also, I would also say he's really not, he's not a felon in any way, shape or form. He's a sort of, he's an ex-Marine himself. And he's uh, he's an insurance agent, and he's just one is is the you know the best salesman of the year. He's off to he's supposed to be off in Hawaii with his ex-wife any day. So you know, by, he he makes a very silly error and runs from police, but yeah. but he's not he's not a bad guy in any way, shape, or form. Can I just jump in for a second? Uh, one of the things I thought that was really interesting about this is that um, you know the the excuse they gave they gave was that or their official version was that he was what thrown from his bike and hit his head really hard against something and you know it's it was such a lame story in retrospect because all Edna Buchanan had to do was go to the scene and, and determine there wasn't anything for him to hit and uh, yeah. so you knew that they they weren't expecting anybody really to look into this story yeah and the and the other thing that comes out in the trial when the coroner is speaking is he's beaten so badly that the, the coroner was actually tricked, uh, not by the cops' reports, but because of the extent of injuries that had happened to McDuffie's head. And it was the equivalent of being pushed on a concrete building, four, floor, four, four floors high, head first on, onto concrete. So, you know, that's quite a blow that, that he received. So the guys, you know, administering that punishment that night were really out to, to, to hurt him. Right. Now, actually, for both of, for both of you, um, can you kind of put this in context, this particular city and what's going on in Miami, in the, in the national context, or what's going on uh, throughout the rest of the country? It's a transitional period, as you said. It's an election year. It's a swing from left to far right, uh, ushering in kind of the Reagan years. So economically, it's, there's a sea change going on. What were some of the other kind of factors that led this particular year to be such a turning point? John, you want to go first? No, you go first. I'm still <laughs> so thinking about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, oof. I mean, it's a big, it's a big question. Why? I mean, there's so much going on in 1980. I think what, why we don't really deal with it then is Miami's a tourist city, so sweep that thing under the carpet as quickly as you can to get things going again. B, it's an election year. We're in this very odd position in Miami that the mayor of Miami is actually a very close friend of Jimmy Carter's. You would have thought that was a recipe for federal help, but instead, because it's an election year, Miami is left out to hang to dry, right? There's very little federal help, and the help that does come is sort of grudging and slow, both for McDuffie and for the Mariel boat lift and for cocaine. You ask the DEA in 1979, what's your number one drug issue in America? They would have told you it was heroin. DEA agents in Miami knew much better, but they hadn't sold that fully to Washington yet. So there's all sorts of things that, that should be bubbling up from Miami to DC and should be ringing alarm bells all over the place. But instead, the temptation is to think that these things are just Miami problems rather than American problems. But these things are, you know, drugs by 1989, when they do a poll in 1989, number one issue for the number one threat to Americans, according to Americans, isn't nuclear war, it's drugs. And you know, where is that really beginning? It's the late 70s and 1980 in Miami. You know, maybe we should have paid a bit more attention a bit more quickly way back then. 
And then of course, you know, just a few short years later, crack, crack hits and probably completely changes the city again. Well, crack, crack, crack was, uh, uh, crack was just a cheap way to get cocaine out into the neighborhoods because, uh, because the powder cocaine, which is a much heavier hit was, a or a longer term hit at any rate was, was considered to be sort of a white drug. Uh, crack became kind of a ghetto drug. Uh, you had to be fairly after what, what, what the entrepreneurs did with crack was they made cocaine available to everybody. And, uh, but my, my thought about your original question about what was going on in the 80s was that, was that Ronald Reagan um, ran a campaign that I think a lot of blacks were desperate to get Jimmy Carter reelected because they saw Reagan as explicitly racist. And, and so that just piled on uh, more onto the tensions of unemployment, uh, of, of uh, you know, of unemployment of drugs, of, of heat, I mean, Miami had it all, all the things that could lead to a riot. I mean, you know, like like you have those uh, non-air conditioned places down in Miami in the, in the uh, summertime. I mean, uh, the heat was stifling and uh, so everybody go outside. And I mean, it was just uh, it, it, everything that you could think of was there. Uh, everything that you could think of that could lead to a riot, everything that but Miami was also on its way to becoming uh, the capital of South America. And, uh, and so in some ways, I think that the people living there, like me, really thought of us as being a little bit separate from the United States as a whole. Uh, we, were, we were Florida. And, uh, and the other thing is that, is that we had a white establishment that was explicitly racist, I think. Uh, the place was sort of governed by an association of executives and, and uh, PR people and we lost him. Uh -oh, we lost couldn't him. have a black head to their house. And and so so everything everything about that you could say that was bad was there, which again, like I said before, made it a great place to be a reporter. Did you have that <laughs> feeling in the air, John, that there, that this was a powder keg? At that time, was it very? Did it feel very volatile? And we thought it was a powder cake. Uh, these two women and I, who worked uh, out of the ghetto in '77 or '78, thought it was a powder cake. Then we thought that it would go off before 1980. But uh, people like Joe Oglesby would routinely come back and say, "You know, there's going to be trouble now," and there wasn't trouble. It took a while to build, but when it built, it really went off. I mean, uh, when 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 it when it. And, and there were all kinds of, you know, some other tensions included the fact that uh, as the Cubans became from the original Cuban uh, uh, migration back in the late or late 50s and early 60s, those people had nationalized and they had moved heavily into politics. And one of the things that they did was they had, um, they, they began to become cops and became, uh, became become administrators in the Miami and the Miami-Dade uh, Dade County governments. And um, black people saw them as competitors and, 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 the, and the Cubans saw them as competitors. And, and the, the, the Cuban cops had no mercy on, on, on black people because, because there was that whole racial thing going on at the same time. And so it was, it was uh, interesting. Uh, Nick, just kind of following up on this a little bit, in, in the prologue of the book, which is set in 1979, you talk about this very uh, theatrical uh, shootout that takes place on the on the freeway, and um, you know, very brazen in you know broad daylight in front of all kinds of witnesses, and it reminded me a little bit of um, well, the the kind of baroque. Uh, staged assassinations you see today with the uh, cartels um, and um, was this kind of a do you see it as kind of, there kind of a through line between these two periods where this is starting to set the stage for what hap what we're dealing with now yeah and I think in some ways you can you can make that argument of course then it was so new that you, you couldn't see it as, as this coming pattern. It just seemed like this extraordinary oddity. 
I mean, who on earth would stage a machine gun fight from moving cars in heavy traffic in the middle of the day? I mean, it just made no sense, right? What were your odds of getting away? In the end, one car did get away, but one car didn't, and 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 a group of Colombian Colombian gangsters were were arrested when there was a body in the trunk and and several pounds of cocaine that then goes missing. Uh, but things like that just seemed like like hopefully a one-off. But of course, it wasn't. It was that was April. Then in July, you get the famous Dadeland killings, where where you've got Colombians with machine guns entering a liquor store in in a very upmarket mall. Uh, and from that moment forward, you know Miami sort of is holding its breath because this is this is obviously going to get more and more common, and it does. And the following year, you've got homicide detectives who've dealt with maybe singles or or double homicides who are suddenly dealing with with multiple triples and quadruples, and you know they don't even have they don't have the manpower uh, to deal with this sort of thing. But it's it, but it's everywhere. Now, for, you know, to take your point, is there a direct follow through? Well, this is sort of the beginning of wherever you've got that much money and that much market to grab you're going to get you're going to get the violence so i think that's the real thing you would follow again is it's market share and, and money and certainly in miami there you could make you, you know you could make enough a fortune for 10 lifetimes in a year uh, and several people did when we when ed and i did our investigation of ricky Crevero, uh, he supposedly was spending a million dollars a year on cocaine and hookers uh, and we had several rather hilarious stories involving Ricky, uh, actually was what you call Ricky's excesses, uh, including uh, blowing up a body with dynamite uh, down in the Florida Keys, and, and it just sort of went on. They were uh, bombing a guy and blowing his legs off, and it turns out that the guy ran a bar called the Climax, which was, you know, totally nude dancing, uh, which they had in Miami at the time. It was very... It was very colorful, but it was also uh, the corruption was just rife. I mean, it was just rife. When you talked about the FBI looking at the homicide detectives there, um, there was a, a moment, and I don't know exactly what year this was, um, but uh, there was a TV show called Miami Vice. And uh, the Miami Vice guys wore pastel sport coats and one of them lived on a yacht and they drove Lamborghinis and stuff. And, and uh, about a week after the show came on, the entire, uh, the entire vice department of the Miami, of the Miami cops showed up in pastel sport coats from JC Penney. And it was just, a, it was just a, a, I don't know. It was just something that happened there. It, it, it was all, when I, when I read your book, I, I was just amazed because it just took me back to this really bizarre time that you almost, it's almost not believable anymore. And yet, you so, can't believe all that shit happened. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and here we are again, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can both of yeah. you kind of weigh in a little bit about, a little bit more about Edna Buchanan? And, you know, in a lot of ways, as she's presented in the book, um, you know, she was a real trailblazer, you know, as a, as a police reporter, you know, as you as you describe it, it was overwhelmingly white males in this job, and um, and I guess her predecessor was uh, Janet Reno's father. Is that correct, Daniel? Yeah. Daniel uh, Reno. Yes. Did you know him, John? I did not know his father. Her father, no. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think this. There she is up here, on the wall. Uh, uh, yeah. But you know, she's described as this kind of. Uh, very, uh, very glamorous, big, you know, big bouffant, high heels, jumpsuits and stuff. Uh, um, can you just kind of talk a little bit more about her and as, as a pioneer or a trailblazer? Well, she was actually uh, a somewhat delicate woman. She was not a big bruiser or anything like that. She was somewhat delicate, right. quite pretty, um, always had her hair done, carried a gun in her car. Um, she had... Um, uh, there was a, a guy who was a mafia guy, and he disappeared off a golf course, I think, up in Broward County, and uh, but he was or, or northern northern Dade County, but I think it was in Broward County, but he was pretty famous as a mafia guy or associated with mafia guys, and he was like on the ninth green, and they found his bag, but no guy, and so then uh, like a couple weeks later, uh, some people noticed this. Uh, this barrel floating in Biscayne Bay, and they pull it up, and there's a body in it. And it had 
they punched holes in it to release the body gases, but they hadn't punched enough and they accumulated up at the top of the barrel that made it float. So they pulled it out and according to the story, and I don't know if this is true, it may be apocryphal, Edna went to the scene and the cops had his barrel and they're all kind of standing around looking at it and they were talking about what they're gonna do and it had been out there for days. And according to the story, Edna got down on her hands and knees and looked through one of the holes in the thing and she saw a Rolex watch that she identified as the watch that the guy had been wearing. So before the cops even knew about it, she drove back to the paper and wrote a story that his body had been found and that he had been executed and dumped in uh, Biscayne Bay. I mean, that, that was just, uh, that was like one end of the story. And, and, and there was a story about a body was found on a roof. And I'm not sure about this, but it might have been that somebody was driving at 130 miles an hour in their, in their Lamborghini, you know, with a convertible, hit something hard and the body flew up in the air and nobody could find, the car was wrecked, but there was no body. Turns out it was on a roof. And now I'm not sure that this story may be apocryphal too, or there may be two or three stories conflated here. But uh, the story was that Edna wanted to go up and look. And so she always wore skirts uh, when she wasn't wearing her jumpsuit. And she was in a skirt and she started up the step ladder. And uh, one of the cops kind of edged over under the step ladder so he could, he was doing it obviously so that, you know, he was gonna look up her skirt and she went up like that. And she said something to the effect is, go ahead and look, you son of a bitch. And, and, uh, and made him back off, and she went up on the roof looking for the body. So. Yeah. Yeah, I would add that she, there was, uh, you know, I'm sure John could testify to this, but she was an absolute workaholic. Uh, and, you know, she, she had a police scanner at home, there are police scanners all over the place, and she was very territorial. If, if she arrived on a, on a scene and there was a, another report that had been, been sent over because of, because city desk couldn't find her she would bark and get them out of there as quickly as possible that was edna's terrain and every morning she would go and visit all the local police departments miami beach the county the city and beyond you know looking for those stories because you know there was no shortage of these extraordinary colorful crimes that that you know just became pure miami and edna was all about getting that tiny detail just like you said john looking looking through the barrel to look at the watch she would also, you know, it would. You, the stories had these great little touches of, you know, what's the what's record is playing on the phonograph, you know, as the body, you know, the body slumped on one side. I mean, just detail after detail, and they're, they're they're fantastic, and there's something slightly moralistic about them as well. So they really were these sort of these packaged, packaged perfect crime stories. There is. Well, I'll tell you, uh, uh, just one other Edna story that relates directly to to Nick's is that there was a, a guy who was killing women and throwing their bodies in ditches in far south Dade County, which is the first place I worked as a reporter at the Herald. I worked briefly as an editor before that. And uh, Edna had been tracking these bodies. She suspected there was a serial killer at work, but people were kind of saying, well, it could be a couple guys. Uh, and so we found this body and I had a radio that I, because we didn't, we didn't have uh, cell phones and I had this radio that I talked I could talk to downtown Miami with. And um, and I went out and I looked at the body and uh, I called her up and I did my usual, you know, body of a 14 year old woman. My man. And then she asked me like 200 questions. What side of the road was he on? She had gravel on her forehead? Was she thrown on the road? Was she upside down in the ditch? Was she right side up in the ditch? Has her clothes been disturbed? And she went through this huge list of questions which was almost like a model for me to follow when I did other crime stories down in the south end of Dade County. She was, uh, I mean, she wanted to know every single detail. She was a pretty amazing woman. She, I imagine she still is. Actually, I haven't seen her in a long time. She yeah. died. I would add one final thing, which is when one of the detectives I spent spent some time with was a guy called Frank Wesolowski, who is this extraordinarily great detective in, in 1980 who solved some, some really tricky tricky crimes uh, and he's, his, his forte was interrogation and he then when you get this new wave of cops in, in 1980 who are replacing all the guys who've been arrested or jailed uh, by the FBI, he now has to teach interrogation to this whole new new, new group of, of homicide detectives and I asked him how do you know who, who did you base it on, what, thinking it would be another cop and he's like no 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 he's like I tell them to follow Edna Buchanan's you know the way she 
would ask 400 questions. You know, just if you can keep them talking, you're going to get your answer. So that's how influential she was. I guess I got kind of a, a more general question for both of you. I, um, I had the privilege of interviewing Mark Bowden, the journalist, about his new book, and it was a lot of fun to talk to him. And I asked him about if he saw a lot of similarities between the role of the reporter uh, and the role of the detective. And um, that inspired a an, an very interesting exchange uh, for both of you. I mean, I guess John first, since you write, write about investigators, do you, see, do you see a lot of through line between those two roles? Um. Well, uh, you know, not in my own case, no. Uh, I observe cops, uh, but the other thing is that reporters can ask anything, and cops sort of are, are constrained by what they have to, what they can do legally. And so uh, uh, we would talk to all kinds of people, but, but we also didn't have the ability to pin somebody down and make them answer questions. We didn't have the ability to threaten them. Uh, you know, a cop could say, you know, if you roll over on Joe, We'll let you go, and uh, because what you did isn't all that bad, and what Joe did is really bad, we couldn't do that. Uh, we would have to go talk to Joe directly, and then we'd have to plead with him. So, so the way we worked was was considerably different from the way the cops worked. Um, the, pa and, the and paper didn't have any muscle, any hired muscle. Pardon me? The paper didn't no. have any hired muscle you could take along. I think I was it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but but you know you just it's just different than being a police officer. I wouldn't want to be a police officer, and uh, uh, and I think that, that most cops wouldn't want to be reporters. They're, they're sometimes seen to be sort of parallel to each other, but they're really not. We have very different functions. Yeah, I think that's one of, the interesting. Things, one of the things I put in my books a couple of times with Virgil Flowers because of my reporting background is Virgil tells everybody what what's he, what he's finding in his investigations, and it drives cops crazy because they won't tell anybody anything. Virgil says, I know what I know, and the killer knows everything. Why wouldn't I tell everybody else? Because I'm not hiding anything from the killer. But that's not the way cops think. And, and newspaper reporters are, 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 have a tendency to put it out there even if it's wrong, and then they'll find out later and fix it. And, and cops aren't like that. Cops want to hold it tight. It could be a, it could be a romanticized notion of um, you know, the, uh, the detective being loyal, you know, being obsessed with the case. Uh, and the reporter being obsessed with the story, you know, kind of the same, the same. That could be a romanticized way of looking at it, though. Well, I think certainly for Edna, a lot of those stories that she wrote, it's normally one and out, and you know, especially in a year as busy as eighty or eighty-one, where you're covering uh, on average two murders a day, uh, you don't have time to to go back and you know do anything other than cover a case, let alone solve it. So, so, but there are moments. There's the crazy moment in nineteen eighty when during the riot when the captain of homicide is desperately trying to get to the homicide department and he can't because the riot's already started and he's forgotten his radio. Where does he go in order to stay in contact with his whole squad? He goes to the Miami Herald and he goes up and he sits down at Edna's desk because he knows Edna uh, and he's making the calls and then jumping on, on the police scanners and, and trying to coordinate everything from the Herald. So there were these moments where, where they seemed to be you know, on, on the same side, which is, of course, not what would have happened either side of a year is the same as that. Okay, I'm just looking here on my phone to see if we have some questions from our audience. And I've got a lot of people tuned in, but no real specific questions. Um, so there you have it. Okay. You want to swap over here for Yeah, I'm going to swap. Gentlemen, I have to go and lead a discussion group on Cornell Woolrich, so... <laughs> Right. It was very nice talking with both of you. It was nice great. talking to you, Tim. I'm going to weigh in on Edna for a minute because we were fortunate. You know, she turned into a remarkable crime novelist, just like you, Jen. Um, and she visited this, the Poison Pen several times with her books. Right over Patrick's head is Edna in a pink blazer over a black jumpsuit, a, a photo of her here in the store. I just looked her up, and she is just slightly older than I am and living in Patterson, New Jersey. So um, I think she's retired. She hasn't written a, a novel for quite a while, but she brought the same skills, I think, to writing novels that she brought to reporting. 
in that she was very detail oriented, very well structured. Like you, John, except maybe you go a little more without a road map than in the probably the I don't know though. I was thinking about your canoe, you know, you broke your arm fielding your canoe and I was thinking about Virgil paddling down the river in one of your books <laughs> in his canoe. So life things. I wanna ask Nicholas, are you going to write a novel again? I was so in love with your fiction, and here you are, all these years right. later. Well, the problem is if you move to Miami, you don't need to write fiction, right? Because the, the truth is so outrageous down here that uh, you know you, I don't need to impose any kind of structure of my own. Yes, I'd love to write another novel at, at some point, but for the moment, I've got my eye on another piece of, of Miami nonfiction because some of these stories I just don't think are well known even inside Miami, let alone outside. And I think Miami is is one of, you know such a young city. It's only 120 years old. It really lives without a lot of respect from the rest of America. And yet, if you ask the international community, it's one of the most famous cities in America. So it's 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 a very odd odd place to be, and that's what makes it a wonderful news town. I mean. You can't be a wonderful news town without bad things happening in your city because that's why you're a wonderful news town. Uh, but I find it absolutely a riveting, riveting place to live. But we're I have a couple, have to, I'm sorry. I have, a, I have a couple of things to say about that. I'm writing a book now that's set in Miami, a novel that I'm just about halfway through. And, and it's kind of embarrassing after I read this book because a lot of the stuff that I have in my, when I have my novel looks like it's taken out of your book. Uh, I actually own a boat up in Fort Lauderdale, but I can't get to it now because of the coronavirus. Um, Carl Hyacin is an old friend of mine, and uh, I've known him for a long time. And, and uh, he said uh, one time that, that every time he wrote something outrageous in one of his books, he had a he had a, uh, a bouncer in one of his novels who had his hand bitten off, I believe, by a barracuda. And he had, a, instead of having a hand put back on, he had a he had a weed whacker put on it because that threatened people where he the bars where he's the bouncer. He said every time you came up with something like that, you'd read the newspaper the next day and there would be something more outrageous than what you thought of. You could never keep up with Miami then. And um, and um, so you're right. Miami is a place where all you have to do is stand out in the street and you cut all the material you need. I'm sure yeah. that's true. We're going to have to sign off because Patrick's group is coming. But there was one question I did want to ask John, which will sort of put him on the spot. And I don't mean it to do it that way. But narrative nonfiction, John, you know, you're so interested in structure. You and I have lots of talks about the structure of thrillers and so forth. Do you find that narrative nonfiction, the kind of book that Nick has written, is, um, is just as powerful? Um, as a thriller is just that it's fact-based rather than fiction-based? Oh, sure. And I like, I actually like fact-based movies better than most fictional movies. Um, and I like, I like strong fact-based books. You know, who's the guy who wrote, uh, uh, you know, The Force and uh, he wrote uh, the books about dope across the border in Mexico? Don Winslow. Winslow's. Winslow's books, if you read them, they're almost non-fiction. I mean, a lot of the events that he talks about actually happen, and then he sort of fictionalizes them, and he puts them in a, in a, in a, in a fictional structure that makes all that stuff stronger, because because then he's able to manipulate events. But a lot of that is very close to nonfiction. So there's a there's almost like a hybrid in some areas of fiction now that is both fiction and nonfiction. The same thing is true with uh, uh, Black Hawk Down. Uh, Black Hawk Down is not fictionalized. I think it's it's more it's closer to what Nick is writing, but at the same time, a lot of fictional techniques get used that, that weren't traditionally used in uh, in in you know the kind of the drier, stupider nonfiction books. And 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 uh, so you read something like Nick's book and you say, well, you know that really it, to me it really brought back that whole era and. And, and I actually, in a lot of ways, love being down there, running around in the streets and sweating and smelling bad. And I went out to the L-1011 uh, uh, airplane crash. That was uh, Nick mentioned in his book. And I started thinking about that when I read about this in the book about uh, Marshall Frank, you know, one of the, I, I guess it was Davis, yeah. uh, the coroner, had all these bodies come in. Well, I was out there waiting around in the Everglades. And uh, so, so I just read that one line in Nick's book and all of a sudden there I am back there waiting around the Everglades, 
looking at an armless, headless, legless body being taken out of the weeds. I mean, you know, it's good stuff. So what can I say? Well, you asked, you answered a question I didn't quite ask you, which was, did you think that Nick's book was a great example of narrative nonfiction? And indeed, Nick, without my actually pinning him really? down, that's what he said. Um, I think I think you're wonderful. Both of you are wonderful writers, and and I agree with Jen that that narrative nonfiction and and thrillers can be so close together that you can read one without the other. So one reason, audience, because we're about to sign off, that. I thought it would be a great idea to put the two of them together. Was so that wait, wait. Oh. Before you before you sign off, before you sign off, can, Nick, can you give us any hint about what the next book's going to be? Uh, or would you rather not? You, well, I, I'll give you a hint. Uh, the the hint will be that yeah, looking at another time in Miami when when ludicrous events are taking place, but also what I find fascinating about Miami is this is the place where you first get the triangulation of races in America this Latin, black, and white, and that's really what I, what I want to concentrate again, how you could have a city where, where people are doing these different things at the same time in different neighborhoods uh, that seem to have nothing in common, but, but in this, what, the story I'm pursuing, there's, a, there's an awful lot of interaction between the races that make it absolutely fascinating. Well, the thrust, be... the thrust of my question was to say to you, if you like John Sanford's thrillers, you would indeed enjoy reading Nick's book, or if you like Don Winslow, you would enjoy reading Nick's book. So, gentlemen, this has really been fabulous. I have so much enjoyed it. We'll have to do it again. But let me wish you a good evening, and thank you both very much for joining us tonight. Hey, thank you so much. Bye. Say goodbye. Bye. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye. I will. Patrick's right here saying bye. <laughs> Great. There you are.